Welcome to this session of Shadow the Scientist. My name is Jamika Marshall, and I am the coordinator for the Shadow the Scientist initiative. Uh, we have here one of the members of the observing team. This is um, Raja Guhart Kartha, who is also, of course, the founder of the Shadow the Scientist initiative. And he was just bringing us up to speed about um, some troubleshooting issues they're dealing with on the mountain right now. Um, that is snow flurries. Um, so what what happens on cloudy nights? What do what do astronomers mm -hmm. do? Well, um, so we have, um, you know, we had plans to use the telescope and collect some data, and um, and I can certainly describe what we were planning to do tonight had the um, weather not interfered but what we'll end up doing is we'll do other useful things that we need to get done as astronomers uh, i need to download some software to bring my computer up to speed so that i can connect to remote sessions uh, i could with my old computer with my new computer i need to upgrade a software installation so that's something practical that i will um, will take care of tonight probably um, a second thing is we are discussing what science we can do with data we've already collected and what analysis, what questions we can answer. And um, that's something that, again, we'll, if we're going to get into, um, you know, um, that would be a more technical discussion about, um, well, much of this, uh, um, much of this discussion is technical anyway, but yeah, so, uh, but I also definitely want the people gathered here. Thank you so many for so many people have gathered here today. Um, some oh, I see Future Hope School. I'm so happy to see that you have connected today. Um, um, so I I wanted Eric and Elisa and when Rosalie gets here and if Max drops in, I wanted them to introduce themselves and talk say a little bit about. Who they are and why they, how they became to become astronomers. So, um, but, and I, I will introduce a few people on this call as well. I particularly wanted to introduce Future Hope um, as um, one of the partners here. Um, I'm going to message you, Jamika, um, and uh, uh, in the chat, if that's okay. Absolutely. And maybe while you're doing that, Eric, please introduce yourself. Welcome. Hi there. Yeah. Uh, great to, to be with you. Um, wish it could have been on a clearer night. Uh, but um, I'm Eric Peng. I'm an astronomer at uh, NORLAB, which is the U.S. National Observatory based in Tucson, Arizona, but also with uh, observatories in uh, Hawaii as well as uh, in Chile. And uh, my research interests are uh, mainly in galaxy evolution, so similar to Raja's, looking at nearby galaxies. And um, in this case, we are trying to understand a very strange class of galaxy, which is called ultra diffuse galaxies, which are galaxies that have. Uh, are quite large for the amount of stars that they have. Um, and one of the questions is whether they have very large amounts of dark matter. And we have a previous paper, which is led by our collaborator, Elisa Tolova, um, who's also observing with us, uh, indicating that the galaxies that we are targeting in this observing session um, may have very, very large amounts of dark matter. Um, and so uh, we are trying to confirm that uh, and uh, by seeing how quickly their stars are moving. So the faster they're moving on their orbits, the more uh, sort of gravitational pull there is that keeps them there, um, that's balancing that out. So uh, we're trying to do this, but these are exceedingly hard to to measure. Um, they, uh, the the sky you think of as being dark, um, you think the night sky is dark, it's not actually dark. There actually is some emission from the Earth's atmosphere and also from dust in the solar system. Um, and so these galaxies are actually even much fainter than 
the brightness of the dark night sky. Uh, so we have to use a very big telescope like the Keck telescope uh, to, to observe them. And over a whole night, we basically, our plan would be to observe one galaxy for the whole night. Um, and so that's, uh, I don't know how much I told you about our, our science and our observing plan, but that that's what we're doing um, with uh, this time. That's what we would be doing with this time if it were clear. But at the moment, it is not clear. Um, and uh, let me just see if, uh, oh, you can't really, it's pretty dark outside right now. So I was going to see if there was a web camera or something to go, but it's pretty it's pretty dark. Thank so, yeah. you so much, Eric. Um, we were actually just about to pull up some of the cloud cams, but you're saying, no, it's not, not a very good view. Oh, no, actually, I mean, I'm sure some of the cloud cams might show something, but um, the one I'm looking at at the moment is not, uh, it doesn't show very much. So I'm wondering if there's a better one to look at. Well, while Eric is um, trying to find a better webcam to maybe sh um, share with us so that we can get a good view of the of the skies over Mauna Kea, um, Elisa, if you, I lost you, I saw you. Where did you go, yep, Elisa? I'm here. Okay. Yes. Welcome, Elisa. Please introduce uh, yourself to our, our group. Hi, everyone. So I am Elisa Tolova, professor of physics and astrophysics at the University of the Pacific at, um, in California. So I am originally from Spain. I did my PhD in in Madrid and my um, my degree in physics in Madrid and a PhD in astrophysics in Madrid. And then I moved to California um, with a postdoctoral position, which is a position to do independent uh, research and basically gain the skills to be able to um, lead your own uh, research projects. And then I stay here in the, in the same area, didn't move too much and got my position at the University of the Pacific where I do research with Raja and Eric and yeah, teach my classes, <laughs> basically. We definitely have had some comments earlier in the chat um, that were well sent to me directly, but also I think also publicly in the chat that we have uh, some um, definitely have students here who are interested specifically in physics, um, and I'm, I'm assuming also astronomy and astrophysics, but specifically physics and some students who um, are currently taking physics classes. So um, if you have any, yes, okay, great. Um, thank you, Sesame, and I'll ask that just as, in just a moment. Um, so if you have any specific questions about uh, physics and what aspects of, of uh, physics you need to work in astrophysics or astronomy um, in general. These, you have experts right here, all three uh, ready to engage with you since uh, we are waiting for the weather to be a little bit better. And so I will throw out a question to all three of you, Elisa, Eric, and Raja. The question from Sasmit is, what exactly are ultra diffused galaxies and what would happen if they were to collide? Well, um, you, sorry, sorry, Eric, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, uh, Elisa might have, I don't know, oh, maybe you don't, I don't know if you have it on this computer, but, um, It'd be nice if we could show some pictures, maybe, of what they look like. Um, but uh, a galaxy is um, a, uh, you know, is a, basically a collection of stars and gas and dark matter uh, that have come together due to gravitational collapse in the universe. And 
galaxies come in all kinds of flavors, right? There's like the Milky Way galaxy, our own, which are these disky spiral galaxies. There are these more football-like um, elliptical galaxies that come in all different sizes and shapes and masses, um, but not in like all possible ones. They, the, the larger ones tend to be more massive, the smaller ones less massive. Ultra diffuse galaxies are ones that are just what the name says, they're more diffuse, they're more tenuous in their uh, star distribution than, than typical galaxies of that mass. Um, and so one of the questions is why did they form in that way? And what does this tell us about galaxies and how they, uh, how they evolve? And as far as if they collided, well, it kind of depends that um, on on what they're made of, right? If there's a lot of dark matter or a lot of dark matter, um, galaxies merge all the time in the universe, um, and uh, that's a process that's constantly happening. And those those galaxies then merge and become larger units. I don't know if either of you want to add anything else. I was going to respond to something in the chat, which is um, there was a question about whether um, dark matter is a form of energy. Well, all matter is a form, uh, or all matter is a form of energy, and all energy is a form of matter. That sounds very philosophical, but Einstein's E equals mc squared tells us that matter and energy are interconvertible. Sorry, that's one bit I wanted to add, unrelated to UDGs. Oh, yes. Thank you for getting to that question. Um, and then we have, um, and thank you, um, Eric, for that response about galaxies and UDGs in particular. Um, so we have a question um, about... Um, resources for someone who is just starting their um their journey into astrophysics and astronomy to so someone who loves space um and loves this field and is just getting into it they're very much a beginner um and and an enthusiast and kind of starting to study on their own before getting into their classes in school so uh for all three of you please uh what what would you recommend uh, as resources to to get started to build a foundation of of good knowledge? So um, there are different ways of of approaching that. So ultimately, to be a professional astrophysics astrophysicist, what you need is very strong math and physics background. So understanding physics, learning a lot of math, you know, like um, algebra, calculus, etc. That is going to be the foundation to then um, specialize in, in a field like astrophysics. So that is one path. And then um, also, you know, um, just um, watch YouTube videos about, you know, uh, the evolution of stars and you, there are lots of um, astronomy concepts that you can understand without all of that foundation that you are going to need to then measure things. So just uh, understanding how um, stars uh, work, that uh, those are concepts that you can just understand uh, watching uh, YouTube videos or reading books about astronomy. So um, for the enthusiasts, I would do both things in parallel. So, you know, when you are, have to choose your classes, uh, choose math and physics, that's going to help you to do this field uh, professionally. Um, but also, you know, uh, to keep your curiosity fed, uh, use YouTube and, you know, the internet to learn about, you know, the mergers of galaxies, uh, what kinds of galaxies are out there. Um, how big is the universe? Um, how uh, stars are born and how they evolve and die? Uh, how what is a black hole and all those things?
Wonderful, Elisa. Eric, would you like to add anything to that? Um, no, I think that's pretty much covers it. I mean, again, if you're interested in in astronomy, um, you know, math and physics are definitely important. Um, I think another, since we're talking about observing, uh, you know, we work with people who build the telescopes and build the instruments on the telescopes. Uh, we work with a lot of great engineers. And so engineering is definitely something where you can get involved in the uh, observational side of astronomy. If you're not taking the observations yourself necessarily, but you can be building the things that that do the observations. So there are a lot of ways into astronomy, um, career paths that is, you know, there's a lot of also, you know, science writing that people do within astronomy and communicating science to the public. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Um, so many great questions here. Uh, Raja, would you like to add anything else to uh, what Eric and Elisa were saying about good resources um, for those just beginning their studies of on their own, uh, studying astronomy and astrophysics, and as well as any book recommendations or, or even any um, you know, papers that could provide a good foundational knowledge they can build on. Um, no, I have little to add to what Elisa and Eric have said about strong foundations in physics, mathematics, especially certain branches of mathematics. Statistics is a very important element in a lot of experimental science. Um, other thing I was going to say is people have asked about ultra diffuse galaxies at the beginning. Um, I noticed some people are spelling it as ultra diffuse galaxies, which is correct. It's not ultra diffused galaxies. When something is diffused, that means it started out compact and then became diffuse. Uh, to diffuse is also a verb. Um, and it's not clear to me. It's not, I don't think it's clear to astronomers how exactly ultra diffuse galaxies have come to be the way they are. So we know they're diffused now. We don't know if they started compact and then diffused into the thing they are. So no D at the end of the word diffuse. Um, so, and in a sense, this observing run we have that Eric, uh, Elisa and I are here on behalf of a larger team of scientists our goal is to understand what ultra diffuse galaxies are in the following sense. We goal is to understand what processes, maybe there's more than one, what sorts of processes lead to the formation of galaxies that look like, you know, the, you know what that lead to the formation of ultra diffuse galaxies. So we don't know the answers. That's the beauty of this work. Um, oh yeah, there were a few other questions that were completely. Uh, I was starting to answer questions in the chat, but I realize there's so many questions in the chat, it's flowing so fast that the answer is well separated from where the question put in it was put in. So instead, I, I figure it's more effective to answer questions via audio. And uh, one of the questions that I recently learned the answer to during the total solar eclipse, someone asked, how far away is Voyager right now? And it turns out it's 0.93 light days away. So Voyager has taken 50 years to get there, but light would have taken less than a day. So when it sends light back, it takes a little less than a day from the light leaving the instrument or any information it's sending back takes a little less than a day for from the sending of the information to it reaching us. So there's a question, as I, I'm jumping into Q&A if that's okay. There's a question about different branches. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. Um, Eric, you were talking about different ways of studying astronomy. You can do theoretical calculations, you can make measurements, you can build instruments. But the things you can study range from really small scale things like comets and asteroids in the solar system to planets and moons in the solar system to planets and moons around other stars, to the sun, 
other stars like the sun, star clusters, galaxies, collections of galaxies. You know, the galaxies we are studying, we would have studied tonight are in a cluster of galaxies with thousands of galaxies. Smaller groups of galaxies are called groups. So galaxies, groups of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, superclusters, and indeed the universe on its largest scales, things like the afterglow from the Big Bang, uh, dark energy, the large scale distribution of dark matter. These are sorts of the topics that are under the realm of what would be considered astronomy, astrophysics, space science, cosmology. What way is the James Webb telescope better than the Hubble Space Telescope? It's a bigger telescope. The Hubble telescope is two and a half meters in diameter. James Webb is six and a half meters in diameter. <laughs> and the light collecting power of a telescope scales like the square of the diameter, as you know. The area of a circle is pi times d squared divided by four. So pi and four are, of course, universal constants. So the, di the, uh, the power of a telescope in some sense scales as the square of the diameter. Um, so James Webb is quite a bit more powerful than Hubble, but that doesn't tell you the full story. Uh, bigger telescopes not only collect more light, they give you sharper images. This has to do with the phenomenon called diffraction. And uh, in the case of James Webb versus Hubble, James Webb is primarily an infrared telescope, which helps it cut through dust in ways that Hubble is not able to do as well. Do we have images of ultra diffuse galaxies? Nitin, I just corrected you and I said it shouldn't be ultra diffused. It should be ultra diffuse. I'm going to type that into the chat. The correct term is ultra diffuse galaxies. So you just failed your exam. We have, I'm getting some questions about uh, um, the current conditions on the mountain. Um, we've had uh, quite a few people join us in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, so uh, Raja, Elisa, Eric, if one of you could give us an update on the weather and maybe, Eric, did you find a good- uh, I, I've been looking and I've basically found uh... Let me just share. I found a cloud camera from Subaru, which is on the same mountain. Um, so this should be, you should see my browser here. This is a, a camera, a fisheye lens camera looking up so you can see the whole sky. Uh, this is the Subaru telescope, which is um, run by the Japanese National Observatory. And these are the two Keck telescopes, and we're using one of them. Do you know which one is Keck 2? I don't Roger. never know which one is Keck 2 and which one is Okay. Keck. Well, as you can see, the domes are both closed. Although this is this was taken uh about an hour ago, I guess. Um, an hour and a bit. And so let's see if I do. Why is it not? I'm gonna try and figure out which one is Keck 1 and Keck 2 because I can <laughs> see that one of them is closer to Subaru than the other. So I'm going to look for an aerial photo. Of Here we the, go. Of now you can see the time lapse. Um, and I'm going to stop it here. So this is, um, I guess this was just after sunset. Um, you can see the clouds here. You can see the domes more clearly. Uh, these are the lights from Hilo, I guess, the city that's closest. Uh, if I advance them one at a time, uh, this bright object here should be the moon. If you remember, we just had an eclipse recently where it was new moon, and now it's the crest, it should be the crescent moon that's visible after sunset. Um, and uh, it doesn't look so good on the clouds, but... Here you start seeing some stars and the moon's much brighter as you can see. So there is some visibility of stars on the camera here. This is still, even though you see clouds here, it's actually, uh, see stars here, it's actually still through clouds because the camera is quite a bit more sensitive than your eye is. Um, 
So, you know, it actually looks, it's not, not as hopeless as it was, but uh, the, it's not just about whether you can see the stars. Um, it's also uh, conditions like humidity and fog and wind and other things like that. So uh, let me see if I can bring up the, oops, what did I do? I'm going to ask Jamaica a question. Yes, Roger. Jamaica, which, which of the two teles telescopes is closer to Subaru physically? That is a great question. This fish eye view is throwing me off. <laughs> it's, the, it's the one on the right is physically, if I'm, if I'm standing in front of both Keck telescopes, the one that would be on my left is closest to Subaru. So from this image, it would be one, the one on the right, I believe. Yep, the lower That's one. what I'm thinking. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. But I, uh, but I don't know which one is K1 and which one is K2. I can never remember. I, I walked into that building, but I can never remember which one is which. I don't remember either. Um, yes, thank you. Please do not annotate on the images. Thank you. And so, Eric, you were mentioning uh, that there are several factors, not just can we see the stars, uh, even though this fisheye camera is more sensitive than our eyes. And so it may not necessarily look exactly like this if we were there in person. Um, but those other factors are, are very important. Um, we've talked about relative humidity uh, and, you know, and moisture, um, but uh, right. you mentioned something else uh, VOG, V-O-G, and I don't think I've mentioned to yesterday or today uh, what VOG is. Can you tell us about it? Oh, um, well, VOG is like a volcanic, it's like a fog with volcanic uh, smoke and ash, I guess. Um, it's something that you have to deal with if you're on an island with active volcanoes. And so that does um, make occasionally uh, inhibit observing um it's bad for the telescopes you don't want it getting into the dome um and also it, it hinders visibility uh, so this is just um i'm just sharing here you should be able to see the one of the control panels for a remote observing software um and uh this just shows that well this has foul weather that's not actually because there's foul weather outside although there is it's because the telescope is stowed in the foul weather position which uh, keeps it safe from, you know, if there's, I guess, leaks in the dome, um, although the, there aren't, there shouldn't be any. Um, and then down here, you have some weather data. This is the outside humidity, which seems to be around 70%, uh, the dome humidity, which is about 60%. Now, you, of course, don't want the humidity getting too high, uh, the humidity gets very high, especially inside the dome. What ends up happening is even if it's not actually raining, you get condensation of water on various surfaces, the metal surfaces, and um, and that's very bad. So um, you definitely don't want that happening. Although this, this humidity level is uh, pretty, um, it is reasonable, but if you have fog just below the level of the summit, then what can happen is... Uh, if the fog rises, you can immediately, you can very quickly go to nearly a hundred percent humidity. And um, thank you, Eric, uh, for providing some some background about what we're seeing. When you say um, when you say that uh, what we're seeing here, this foul weather. Uh, does, it's not because the weather is actually bad. I mean, it, it's not ideal, uh, but it's the the position that the telescope is stowed in. Are there different, what are the different positions a telescope can be stowed in? And do, will that always be displayed here on the screen there? Um, I don't know, Raja, you might have a better idea what, I know there's the foul weather, there's probably a dome flat position 
yeah. to do calibrations. Yeah. So for foul weather position, they make the telescope vertical because it minimizes its cross-section to any, if there's any chance of internal, you know, something leaking, they want to make the telescope vertical. So chances of water dropping on the surface as well. I think that's what the foul weather position is. It's pointed at the horizon, basically, the telescope. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we can tell that from, is that correct? Let me just see if that. Oh yeah, elevation is nearly zero. Zero, okay, there we go. Yeah. So it's it's all the way over, pointed at the horizon, not vertical. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Pointed to the horizon, just yeah. eight degrees above the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that would probably be to protect the mirror if there was anything dropping from the dome. They worry about ice forming and dropping ice example, falling icicles and things like that damaging yeah right yeah because the air mass is very high so yeah so it's it's the telescope is all the way pointed over right now just to keep it safe so we're not using it the dome is not open uh you can see so i've tried but i failed to figure out which one is kek one and which one is kek two in these images well, this here is a camera at the top of the dome we're observing from. And I'm guessing that's Keck 1 over there. Uh... We did have a comment. Uh, it was sent to, to me, but I did repost it in the, it, to everyone. Um, I don't want to mispronounce uh, the name, but it says that uh, the on the extreme right from the image from I believe from the fish eye image that you were showing us, Eric, that mm -hmm. on the extreme right is Keck one, and the other is Keck two. I see. Okay. Right. Yeah. So what, which would make sense because um, if you're facing them, then from left to right, it'd be one and two. Mm -hmm. Um, let me, it's great seeing this time lapses. And while we're looking at that, and, and thank you so much for um, letting us see some of the, the screens that you all use and are looking at uh, while you're doing your observations um, and that give you vital information as you're progressing throughout the night. Uh, Elisa, we have, uh, I don't know if you saw this one, I'll pull it out because it just uh, popped up from um, Ernesto. Nesto's from Stockton, and um, it says that oh. University of the Pacific is a, a beautiful campus. Uh, and so there's a question about a lot of time use on the telescope. And I guess uh, we can maybe um, direct this question specifically to just about Keck time, and then maybe uh, in general how it, it could be different at other telescopes. But if you have bad weather and you're observations are canceled, your observing time is it's canceled or, you know, it just don't open. Do you need to write another proposal to use the telescope again? Or does your observing time get rescheduled? How does that work, Elisa? Yeah, so unfortunately, we will have to go through the whole process again. They cannot save you the spot. So, so what we're going to do is um, we had one night in March in which we observe some galaxy, not not all the exposure that we wanted, but we have some. And we still have half a night in May and have a night in, in June. So we will have to see what is the total. But knowing that we lost yesterday and tonight, so we lost completely two, two nights, um, which is half the program so far. We are going to analyze what we have, and with that, we will go back, write a new proposal, saying that we lost this time due to weather, that we observe a little bit and show what we have so far, so that the, the committee can evaluate whether that is uh, enough for the project or not. So, you know, uh, the point is going to be, it's obviously not enough, so we will show it, and, and they will say, oh, clearly not enough. So then uh, we will be ranked again, and then we will 
you know, it, the schedule will be done. And then depending on where you were ranked, then you may get new observations or not. So it's never guaranteed. So once you 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 got it and you lost it to weather, you know the tag is so the committee that evaluates the proposals is usually is usually uh, you know compassionate and they will say okay we are going to rank them um, at least you know similarly to to the year before but it's not guaranteed so if there are something uh, new proposals that are extremely strong um, and get higher rank than than us, then you, we may not get the time. So it's never guaranteed. And that is for, for all telescopes that I know of. So um, all telescopes work in this way. So you lost the time, you have to reapply, go through the whole process. And, you know, the the thing is that um, objects in the, in the same way as the, as the sun, so they go up, they rise and set every, every, um, Every night, our objects do the same thing, and they are not observable for the whole year. So we will have to wait again to March, April of next year to be able to reobserve. So the process is a little bit frustrating, but you know we always have lots of data from previous projects that are still ongoing. So it's not that I'm going to be waiting, or we are going to be waiting for next year to complete the observations we have plenty of things to do and you know discoveries to make <laughs> that that we will be working on in the in the meantime wanted to add that ernesto um, is actually part of a research group uh, that i'm connected to um, um Jubica, you may remember margaret lazzarini from um, Cal State LA, actually. Oh, yes, Margaret. So um, Ernesto, Ernesto is actually Margaret's student at at Cal State LA. And we just had a Zoom call the other day and I asked him to join this session because he's looking to, Ernesto is very interested in this kind of work as a long-term um uh, long-term career goal. I mean, uh, not not just becoming an astronomer, but actually working at an observatory. Oh, fantastic! Wonderful. Well, so so glad you were able to uh, join us, Ernesto. Um, and and Raja, while uh, just to uh, follow up with what uh, Eric and then Elisa was saying um, about to you know you losing time and how. What do you do? Um, we had a question here that was sent to me about uh, proposals. What is, I guess there's some people who don't quite understand what a proposal is. So maybe you could give us some basics on what that is and then um, maybe a few of the components that go into it. And Elisa used um, a word, an acronym there, TAC. Uh, could you explain that for us as well? Okay, so um, a proposal uh, basically is a document that we put together where we explain the, the, the goal of the project and then the details of how you're going to use the telescope uh, what are all the the details basically of the instrument that you are going to use in the telescope and all the different configurations that you can use so the te the instruments are usually uh, pretty versatile so that you can uh, make choices um so you have to justify that every single choice that you make is going to um, provide the data that that is going to answer the scientific question that you are describing so the proposal is basically that a document with all that information a few pages of um of all the uh, scientific background of why this um project is important why this scientific question is is important and how you are going to use this telescope to answer that question so that is the, the proposal. And then the TAC that I was mentioning, it, it stands for Time Allocation Committee. 
So this is um, a group of researchers that uh, usually change every every few years, um, and they just evaluate the the validity of the proposal, whether uh, this uh, question that you are proposing in your document is actually uh, that interesting, and whether the way that you are going to use the instrument and the data that you are going to to get and that you are going to analyze are going to be enough to to answer that question so that is the the group of researchers that the the committee that makes uh, the decision and ranks basically grades uh, the proposal perfect thank you elisa um, I'm getting uh, several questions here uh, directly to me about in, in different ways about uh, calculating astronomical distances. And we've had uh, some people in the chat give some responses. Um, but um, if maybe uh, one of you could speak on that, I know there's several ways um, when something is close to us, uh, you know, within a certain amount of light years, we can use one uh, one method. Uh, but then when we're looking at, for example, the distances uh, to and between the galaxies that you all are studying, you know, in the description, you said that uh, it's about 50 million light years from us. How do we get the distances to such far objects? Um, um, and, and we had some questions here Um uh, they're asking about standard candles and uh, how those are used as well. Thank you. Actually, before going on to that, I just the reason I'm sharing this cloud camera here is because it's wanting to show how you can get fooled by things. Uh, well, there are a few interesting things. One is that you know a few minutes ago we were talking in the sky looked like this and we thought oh you know we're we're maybe we're seeing it's a clearing but then uh pretty soon we're we're here now so this is a picture from a few minutes ago so it's pretty pretty cloudy um but one thing that you can notice if i start go back to the beginning here of the sequence once it gets dark and you can see the stars you can actually see see the stars move as the Earth turns, right? This the stars are moving across the sky just as the moon is setting there. Of course, now um, we are. This is what the sky looks like right now. So, this was taken four minutes ago, three minutes ago. So there's really nothing to look at here. And before we get the answers to those questions about uh, calculating uh, stellar, you know, distances uh, to, to uh, you know, to to planets in our solar system, and then you know, to objects very you know, far away, like the Virgo cluster, fifty million light years away, um, I will say that these webcams um, are. Uh, there you can they can be found at the link the Monica Weather Center link. I'll put it back in the chat so it's uh, easy to find and you don't have to scroll. Um, and like Eric was pointing out, it is amazing to see the changes throughout the throughout the night uh, that you can see in the night sky. And these cloud cameras have captured some fantastic um, phenomena um, from. Um, amazing meteor showers and, and um, debris falling back to our atmosphere from, um, you know, space space junk uh, to, um, you know, uh, anything that's happening in the night sky. These cameras are pointed toward it. Um, you can bet on getting some great uh, images of it. And you can actually um, get uh, archived uh, some of the archived images as well too because um, these are pointed they're on all of the time and uh, you know aside from some potential technical issues that would cause it to not be on and, and recording uh, they're pretty much taking images 24 7 so uh, a great resource to to check out and maybe just watch some time and download some of the files to see uh, what perhaps it captured in the past 24 hours uh Thank you, thank you so much, Eric. And so 
Um, yes, standard ca uh, candles and distances to galaxies and to objects like the Virgo cluster. One of the one of the thoughts I had uh, there was a response earlier that telescope on the extreme right is Keck two. On what image? Not on the image we were showing. Uh, Yashwant, were you referring to a different image or the one that Eric was screen sharing? I assumed it was the one a different that image, yeah. screen, and that doesn't help us connect the dots at all. Hmm. It would be really helpful if they had an image that just had a little label Keck one and Keck oh. two on it. I'm I'm really surprised they actually don't. Actually, you know, if you want the observing room in Waimea has a picture of the the two domes and with the and someone put a post it note or something on that says you are here or something like that. I can't exactly. remember. Exactly. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> but it doesn't show Subaru, so I don't know which side Subaru is relative to those two. It That's just shows true. the two Keck telescopes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're standing facing both of the Keck telescopes, Subaru is on the left. Is on the left of the, yeah. the Keck. Yeah. Yeah. That's Having been amazing. up there, it uh, is one of is one of my favorite views. Walking up to these massive observatories, you have both of the Kecks, and then to the left, uh, you know, uh, Subaru, which is has such a different design that it always just stands out to me that I'm looking left of the two Kecks to see it. Right. I I know exactly what you mean because you can't approach the Keck domes. I mean, the entrance is on one side and. I know exactly what you mean, Jamaica, when you face those two, uh, Super is off to the left, but um, but is K1 the building you enter into and the other one K2? I, that's what I don't remember. Yeah, Yashwant, which image are you referring to when you say the order is Kek1, Kek2 and Subaru? Which image and how do you know? Which image in Google? There's so many images in Google. Can you post a link so we can look at it? Yeah, um, while we're waiting, uh, waiting for that link, um, I was absolutely mind blown by the by the realization that Voyager is only a light day away. Yeah, I thought it would be further since it's uh, aren't they Voyager one and two both outside of the solar system now, or is it just one of them? They're both outside the solar system, Jamaica, as far as I know. And that's only one light day away? 0.93, 22.4 hours of light travel time. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I see the image that Yashwant has linked to, but it doesn't say which one is Kek 1 and which one is Kek 2. Um, yes, um, I've had some uh, a few requests for 
some papers that you all have recently published. And so I'm going to drop a couple in the chat, but if you have a recent paper from maybe perhaps in the past year, um, I'll Roger, post something. I'll post yeah. something that Elisa has written recently, right? Elisa, is it okay to post your UDG? Absolutely. And then you have the images of ultra diffuse galaxies. It's there in there. So you can actually share it and show them, Roger. I'm going to look for the paper while you. So this is um. I see, I see your UDG paper. There's a paper from 2018, but you have a more recent paper. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I I was saying that 2018 paper too with dark matter and the ultra diffuse galaxies, in Virgo cluster from their globular cluster populations. I. I love globular clusters. <laughs> um, There's something from last year, 2023. Slightly longer title. Lisa, this is your 2023 paper. Okay, great. That's great. Thank you for sharing that link. I'm going to see if I can find this on the archive so people can download it. Yes, and I'm sure there's some amazing images here that are, you know, uh, this is part of, you know, still part of the research, the project that you're working on now. So with some of the, uh, maybe some of the images, some of the charts there, and the data that you have, be, uh, could we look at some of that? To get a better idea of uh, you know what you've what you've already learned so far, and then maybe connect it to what you were hoping to do in these uh, observations. Sure. Can you can you share the screen with the paper? I can, if you want. Yeah, sure. Let's see, I'm just going to click on click on the link in the chat. Get there that way. Should I just bring up the PDF? Um, I can share my screen if that would be of interest. Yes, please, Roger. I'm just trying to resize things a little bit before I share. Okay, here we go. Elisa, should I scroll down or yeah you can go to the first e the figure that is the images of the of the galaxies. Oh there we go. Yeah here. So these are 10 ultra diffuse galaxies, the 10 that we analyzed and, and actually we have been uh, observing since 2017 and we put the analysis finally together uh, last year. And, and we found that half of them uh, have an enormous amount of dark matter while the other half, they look like in normal galaxies with the regular amount of dark matter. So when you look at them, uh, you cannot guess which ones are the ones with the huge amount of dark matter and which ones are the normal ones. So that is very puzzling. Um, the ones with a huge amount of dark matter, they have so much dark matter that the physics equations that we know and describe the universe and describe how galaxies form and evolve do not predict these galaxies. So we cannot explain these galaxies with the current physics that we know. So that is a very big claim. And as every big claim has to be proved, 
in several ways that are independent ways. So here we were analyzing the, um, we were measuring the dark matter with the globular clusters on these galaxies. So collections of about um, less than a million of stars that are born together so that because they are so tightly gravitationally bound together, they are um, much brighter than one star only because there is nearly a million of them. So we observe those and measuring how fast they are moving, then we estimated the dark matter in these galaxies. So now what we are doing, and actually you can see the names there, and yesterday we were uh, focusing on the third one, upper row, third um, third um, galaxy, NGBS UD, UDG9. That is the, the one that we were observing last night. And what then what we are trying to to do now is to measure their dark matter using the stars instead of the globular clusters, and we should get if they are so dark matter dominated if they have such a huge amount of dark matter we should get the same answer using both methods. But every method has its own caveats, so that's why um, we have to verify this uh, with two different and independent uh, methods because the claim is is quite big is that the current physics that we know is not enough to explain these galaxies so yeah oh you know elisa yesterday we were we kind of uh, briefly talked about Vera Rubin, the, the person, not the observatory, um, and uh, and Dark Matter, her amazing contributions um, to the field and getting that started uh, in this particular area. So when we're looking at kind of the large, the large, large scale structure really? of universe and of galaxies in particular, oh, how do what role does dark matter appear to play? And we're also getting a few questions about the colors, um, the colors that we are seeing in the images. Are those um, are those simulated colors? Are they do the colors represent, um, you know, a temperature, or is that actually what the the telescope was seeing? So while we're waiting for Raja and Elisa, uh, they are appear to be having some some conversations, uh, perhaps with the um, the telescope operators and the staff at CAC. Um, and this is, of course, what we are hoping they're talking about getting back, uh, getting back on Sky. Um, I did drop uh, someone. Um, a few people said they couldn't open uh, the link. Uh, to the paper that was originally dropped there. So I shared another link from the archive. Um, let me copy it again and put it in the chat so you can find it easier. Um, this link should should open for you. Hopefully, um, hopefully this will open for you so that you can um, see, uh, you can download this paper. Yes, post it on the first one. Okay, yes. Yes, um you I have a few questions uh, about this paper. Yeah, you can you can from the link that I just put in the chat. Yes, you can download that paper. Absolutely. Yes, Jamika, so, I I am back. Sorry that um I no was worries. talking to the um, to the telescope operator, and um, it is snowing. So yeah, oh. it, it's going worse. <laughs> oh, <laughs> going worse. no. 
my gosh. I will yeah. just share with uh, people in the chat that whenever we get snow on the mountain, when it accumulates, um, people um, drive up in their trucks and, and, and bring pots and, and cups and, you know, igloos uh, to get, to collect the ice, to collect the snow and uh, come up and play in it, but to get it and then bring it back down and, you know, do different things with it because it's such a, a rare, rare in that it, you know, doesn't happen often, but it is something that does happen throughout the year, but to go and get snow from Mauna Kea is a thing to uh, the people definitely do, especially when you can see it from Hilo. So we'll be looking for some accumulation, um, Elisa, for I'll be looking for it uh, <laughs> uh, for uh, overnight and in the morning. Um, okay, so I'm not observing tomorrow. So then I don't care. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I understand that. Well, we yeah. definitely had some comments, uh, people saying that they are, you know, sorry that you all will have to repropose um, to write another proposal to uh, to capture to get time again um, to to do these um, observations since it was weathered out. Um, but I am so grateful that we are able to look at uh, your papers here and uh, look at some of this data. So what what are we seeing here? So here, actually, the the graph that we are seeing right now is how we select these objects. So what you see is three different panels where there are many gray points. So those are normal galaxies. You see that all the gray points are uh, together within these two dust lines. And these ultra diffuse galaxies are galaxies that are, this is um, in orange, they are um, um, indicated in, in, highlighted in orange. Those are, outside these dust um, lines. So these are extreme galaxies that um, are not like any other galaxies. They are separated. When we look at their luminosity, so how bright it is, that, that is in the y-axis. And there are several parameters in the, in the uh, x-axis. One of it is how big they are, which is the last panel. So these are the largest galaxies. So that's why they are the farthest to the right. And um, how um, this and the other two panels are showing how diffused they are, and that is how uh, why they they show up in the in the left, on the left. So yeah, so these are very um, extreme galaxies that are very faint but very big. So that is what makes them uh, so diffuse. So that's how these um, graphs are just um, showing how we select them to show that these are actually uh, very extreme galaxies. So that's why they are interesting. So are these extreme galaxies being formed in the same way as normal galaxies? Well, some of them may be because of this dark matter, right? When we look at the dark matter, some of them have regular or expected uh, dark matter content. As I was saying before, half of our sample in this paper had um, the regular amount of dark matter expected for that amount of light, so for that amount of stars. But the other half, they do not. And here in, the, in this graph, you cannot say which ones have the extreme dark matter and which ones are the normal. They all look like a sequence and they are all following, they are all along on uh, this dust line. So that's why it is puzzling that maybe this dark matter actually is not that large. And because of the methods that we are using to measure it, um, we are overestimating it. Or maybe it's actually, uh, real and what we are looking at is at different physical processes that are involved into making these galaxies and more importantly making them survive along uh, across time so that's that's the question that we that we are focusing on that's the data that we are trying to get here to 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 be able to measure this amount of dark matter in a different way and confirm whether this huge amount of dark matter is there or it was, uh, you know, uh, um, an effect of the kind of data that we were analyzing. I think at one point, um, 
I hadn't shown this graph, but I was talking about how ultra diffuse galaxies are large compared to other galaxies of comparable luminosity. UDGs are large compared to other galaxies of comparable luminosity. And then opposite for the ultra compact galaxies, which are on the left fringe of this plot, you see a few gray points, small gray points on the left fringe of the right panel. Those are called ultra compact dwarfs. And in our group, we've been studying both galaxies because they're unusual, but in, in exactly opposite ways. And so, um, so we're having, um, I'm getting some more questions about the paper. Yes, um, you should. Uh, so there are two links. Uh, both of those links will go to the same paper. Yes, um, if one doesn't work, hopefully the other one does. And yes, uh, certainly with the second link, the A-R-X-I-V dot O-R-G, the archive, you can certainly download the paper there, um, but you should be able to do that um, from uh, with with both with both links. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to make sure that I said that. Um, can you? Uh, yes, yes, they can explain. Yes, how how do you? Um, which which programming language are you using, or what programs software program are you using uh, to make these uh, wonderful diagrams and graphs? Yeah, so so um, astronomy has actually been evolving um, in which uh, languages we use, but right now um, we are pretty much everybody using Python. Yeah. And so um, Python, um, maybe Roger, would you like to maybe talk about uh, our um, Python and, and research, our PyR programs. Uh, we've already had um, our first sessions this year, but we have sessions coming up. Maybe you would like to share with them about it in case they'd yeah. like to join. Yeah, our research group at Santa Cruz has been offering tutorials in Python in the context of astronomy research, in the context of a particular paper, not this paper, but a particular paper that is about the Andromeda galaxy. And we offer those right now, I think we're offering them three times a year, February, June, and November. Um, it takes for, if someone wants to participate in that tutorial, they actually have to download software onto their own laptop. Um, and doing it on a laptop is best. It's, um, you know, I can't really, I'm not aware of phone, downloads that can allow you to run Python. They may be, but I'm not aware of them. Um, so downloading some software onto your computer and then following along with uh, their mentors uh, from our research team who um, you know, explain how Python works. And I'm just dropping a link to the Crest Python in research. Um, Bring it there in the link, and as as Roger was saying, there are uh, resources you can, which you can see uh, some previous programs, um, previous sessions there, I and mean, then you can go directly to the um, PyR website, and there you can find um, like, again, yes, this past uh, recordings of past tutorials. Uh, we had sessions in February, as Roger was saying, um, but there. There are things that you would need to um, kind of download beforehand just to, to get started. But all of that can be found on the web page. Let me drop. This is a more direct link for you. Okay. And so we have someone uh, <clears throat> sharing in the chat to how Python can be used uh, via app on mobile devices. While these images are are incredible these these corner plots wow what what are we what are we seeing here so this is um 
mm, mm, MCMC uh, likelihood analysis. So as I was saying before, if you are going to do this professionally, you need a lot of math, a lot of statistics, and that's what we are looking at here. And, and data analysis based on statistics. So this is Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations that are measuring the the um, central velocity of the galaxy and the dispersion. So let me explain what is that. So in this paper, we were looking at globular clusters in the in the galaxy. So these are collections of, of stars that are born together and they are orbiting the center of the galaxy together. So the, the way, um, um, let's put it this way, uh, like gravity works, okay, uh, is gonna, um, so these globular clusters are gonna show a Gaussian distribution. So when you plot their velocity measurements, so how fast they are moving away or towards the center of the galaxy in their orbit, all of that independent measurements follow a Gaussian distribution, so a bell curve, which has a center that is going to be the velocity of the galaxy and has a width, which is the dispersion. And that dispersion is related to the amount of matter that is in the galaxy and the amount of matter both from stars and from dark matter. So that is how we estimate the dark matter content of of this galaxy. So that is what we are looking at here, that analysis of these uh, Gaussian distributions for all the globular clusters in each one of these galaxies. So there are nine corner plots, 10 corner plots, sorry, sorry, one per galaxy. And the galaxy that we were looking at uh, yesterday is the third in the upper row. So the that one, exactly. And you can see that the velocity dispersion is 83. So that sigma, is 83.5, and this is measured in kilometers per second. That is huge for this kind of galaxy. This kind of galaxy should have around 10, 10 or 20 kilometers per second. And we measured 83.5. So that is why the amount of dark matter that this galaxy must have to have that dispersion is absolutely enormous, absolutely enormous. So you see that most of these galaxies have very big very big uh, dispersions for the first one, for example, is 12. That is what is expected for this kind of galaxy. But the next one is 64. Then we have this with 83.5. And then we have, uh, as you go uh, down, some of them have something like 30, which could be okay, but some others are still in the 60s, 80s, 90s. So those are the ones that we want to verify and measure again to check whether this dispersion we actually recover with other methods, not only with globular clusters. And um, Elisa, coming back to this plot. Yes. The mean is not the mean of the galaxy, but the mean of the globular cluster system. Right? Exactly. Okay. So this is using mathematics to measure the mean level of these of these data points where my cursor is, the mean level and the spread and the vertical spread. And you can see that these two galaxies have a very small spread, number four and number 10, but the other galaxies have a much larger spread, vertical spread. We should have patented a name for this kind of diagram. Oh, sure. Go for it, Raja. I'm names. calling out its name, but I don't know what, what to call it. Uh, this came out of the VDGC project, right? I, I'm sure this is not the first time anyone yeah, used it. Absolutely name. right. And so, um, this so with, with this data that we're seeing here, um were the observations tonight going to be building on um, your uh, the conclusions that you already made here that are published in this paper, or is it something uh, slightly different? So there are two parts to it. So first thing is we are 
remeasuring this with, but with different tracers. So in this in, in this particular analysis, we use globular clusters, and now we are gonna do it with stars. So in that sense, we are measuring the same thing, but in a completely independent uh, way. That is one part of the project. The other part of the project is that now we are observing the bulk of stars in the galaxy. So we are hoping, because they are extremely faint, and you see that we are using several nights at Keck to observe a single galaxy, um, so they are extremely dim. We are hoping that we have enough signal to measure the overall age and metallicity of the stars. And age and metallicity tells us when these galaxies were formed. And they can tell us also, give us some information about how they have evolved. So we are trying to verify their huge dark matter content, but also go one step forward and try to understand why they are the way they are, trying to understand how the stars were formed or yes, basically when and from what kind of material uh, they were formed. So if they were um, very big galaxies that they have been just losing stars for some kind of mechanism, so in that way, we would expect very high metallicity because all very massive galaxies uh, have lots of metals in their stars or whether they have always been very small galaxies with not that many stars. So they were born this way, basically. And for that, we would expect to have very uh, uh, low metallicity. So we are trying to measure that in addition to the to the dark matter to have more information about how these galaxies uh, formed if they were always like this or they were actually huge galaxies that lost their their stars possibly because of the interaction with other stars or the other galaxies sorry or with just the um, uh, amount of matter that there is between between galaxies because the space is never empty there is something there always. Fantastic. Um, thank you for taking us through the, the paper. And uh, again, yes, uh, you can find the paper at either of those links. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, so we, we had some questions about uh, if when the next time they could uh, join you all. And I just, uh, well, this is a direct message to me. So uh, this is for everyone else. Yes, uh, so Raja and Lisa and Eric uh, will have one more session uh, in four hours. That's gonna be at uh, noon GMT on April 12th. Um, do we come thinking we should cancel that session just because last night anything? at that time we only had four people join? Okay, so never mind then. Forget I said that. Um, and, and I was just going to say the likelihood that the weather will be better based on, you know, of course, earlier we were looking at the forecast um, doesn't look too promising. So, yes. OK, no problem. I will go ahead and take it down from the Thank website. You. You. Roger. Mm -hmm, I know no it's problem. a spot decision, but I don't think it makes sense based both on last night. Last night we were clouded and there were very few people who joined at that hour. And um, yeah, we'll just go to sleep and uh, not wait. Mm, okay. And so uh, the question was, when could they, um, when could they um, find you all again? Do you have more observations with Keck or on a, another, uh, with another observatory? Um, we have more observations with Keck in May and June, uh, but um, Jamika has been setting up wonderful Shadow the scientist sessions with many different groups of scientists, um, and um, you know those those happen multiple times a month. Right, I think we are. I think this month we have more than ten sessions in April alone. Um, so keep an eye out for those on our on the Shadow the Scientist webpage. You're right, Jamika. There'll be yes several sessions every month. Yes, I just dropped a link to our website there. Um, I'll be adding at least two more tomorrow. 
uh, there. Um, yes, so um, please, please uh, feel free to to join us and drop in. Um, yes, uh, the um, recordings will be available. I was actually off work during the day today. And so um, I didn't work on the recording, the editing, the recording from yesterday at, uh, at all today because I was I was off. But I will, at the beginning of my workday tomorrow, um, work on that and uh, should have Tuesday session. Those uh, edits should be processed and ready to go too. So just check back and you will find those. Okay, yes, you're so welcome. Thank you all for joining. Um, I see a few people are saying that, that they need to log off. Um, so um, question here about um, certificates of participation. Raja, we've talked about this, but maybe you'd like to address it. We have a, a question a, here says that we expect the participation certificates to boost our students and teachers, you know. No, we'd be working with the CBSC board on, on things like that. So it's not, um, it's not practical for us to issue thousands of certificates. And well, we'd work with the CBSC board. Okay, perfect, perfect. So hopefully you will hear about that uh, from uh, the CBSC um, admin. Um, I, so uh, we have um, just in these last 13 minutes, we have um, some more general questions here um, about um, why do the uh, planets and solar system, why do, why do things orbit? Um, you're so welcome. Um, why do things uh, orbit uh, the center of the Milky Way? Um, yeah, why do things uh, seem to orbit the the center of the Milky Way? Planets in our in our solar system. Um, is there a an actual center of our galaxy? Yes, there is. Um, there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, as there is in many, if not most, massive galaxies. Also, the density of stars increases monotonically as radius decreases. So, in other words, um, it's, it's, it's not strictly monotonic, but roughly monotonically. As you get close to the center of a galaxy, you, get a, you have a higher and higher density star. So, the centers of galaxies, for many galaxies, are relatively well-defined. It, that may not be so for ultra diffuse galaxies, but for most galaxies, the centers are relatively well defined. Wonderful. Thank you, Raja. Um, and oh, yes, you're right. Thank you. We, we didn't get to that. Um, the uh, question about how we define the distances uh, to objects, uh, Elisa or Raja. Uh, distances to um, from Earth to say you know planets in our solar system and then uh, things further afar like the Virgo cluster it's fifty million light years away how is that determined? So, distance measurements in astronomy are a very important thing, uh, but there are multiple methods. So the uh, there's isn't there isn't just a single method that's used for all distance measurements. It's more complicated than that. So um, the most nearby things, which is other stars or even planets in the solar system, we use geometric methods like triangulation. So um, there's something called parallax that's used to measure the distances to stars. In general, nearby things, relatively nearby things are measured through uh, the method of parallax. And um, once we do that, once we know distances of things, then uh, we can measure certain intrinsic quantities, not measured, but intrinsic quantities. How powerful is a star or galaxy? How much energy is it putting out per second? Once we know its distance and how much, how bright it appears to be, we can measure something called its intrinsic brightness. Same thing for size from its apparent size or angular size um, 
and distance, we can know its physical size. So um, once you have these things, once you have a set of objects for which you know intrinsic quantities like intrinsic brightness and size, then you can look for trends, patterns, correlations. You know, what does intrinsic luminosity correlate with? Suppose, I'm making this up, but suppose there were a tight correlation between the color of the star and its intrinsic luminosity. Since color is a distance independent quantity, the color of an object generally, um, you know, to a rough degree, the color of an object doesn't change as you move it further or closer. We can measure its color in a distance independent way. If color were to correlate with intrinsic luminosity, then that becomes a secondary method to measure distances. So correlations provide secondary methods of measuring distances. There are other methods of measuring distances that depend on models. For example, when you measure time delays in gravitational lensing situations, those can give you a measure of distance. You know the speed of light, if you know the measure of, uh, if there's a time delay between two paths, based on a model, you can figure out distances. Because a delta, when you measure a time delay and you know the speed of light, the time delay multiplied by the speed of light has units of distance. And so those, I can, those are three sort of off the top of my head, broad categories of methods. Again, geometric, those are considered primary methods of distance measurements. Um, a second primary method is to time delays of gravitational lens systems. And a third general class of methods is where you're looking at correlations between intrinsic quantities like intrinsic brightness and physical size and distance independent quantities like the period of pulsation for cepheids or um, yeah, the colors of stars or colors of galaxies, those sorts of things. That's a long answer to your question about distances. It's a very thorough answer though. Um... Thank you. Thank you for that, Raja. Um, and there's certainly, um, yeah, a lot of complexity to that. And from the things that Raja was just sharing, uh, she can do some research to find out more details about each of those um, different kinds of, uh, each of those different methods for determining distance, because it is, of course, very important, uh, just as Raja said. Um, maybe in these last, um, eight minutes here, we've had uh, some questions, several on uh, things to study and, and school. So maybe uh, in secondary school, and then um, to lay a good foundation for studying astronomy, astrophysics, physics, things like that, uh, once you get to university. So in eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th uh, grades, uh, what should uh, students be taking if they want to be a space scientist or an astrophysicist? I think we've answered this question a few times, to say math, physics and mathematics. But I think um, one thing that's uh, sometimes overlooked is the power of language and communication. Scientists have to be able to write um, and communicate you know, through any medium, whether you're um, when you see a paper like the one Elisa wrote, and it's um, a written document, when you're giving a talk, it's verbal communication. Communication is an important element of being a scientist. Not just because you're conveying how you, not just because you're conveying what you did, but the very process of communicating something complicated forces you to organize your thoughts in a certain way. And that actually helps with the process of research. Excellent. Elisa, would do, do you have anything to add? Any other um, um, classes that maybe they aren't directly, you know, uh, math and, and science uh, in, in particular, um, but maybe like uh, communication, writing, and public speaking that uh, have played a, a huge part in your success 
um, as as a scientist? Well, I, I would say that uh, programming, if, um, being a good programmer, so that's what we, so, you know, um, we are not looking through the through the eyepiece of a, of a telescope, and we haven't been doing that for um, nearly a century, I guess. Uh, and we, what we do is use computers. And the thing is with the physicists and astrophysicists is that most of that is self-taught in the in the sense that we are not computer scientists. We have been taken many um, uh, classes on computers, but we are very skilled programmers because that is what we do in our everyday research. So what you need is um, computer skills. So everything, you know, this, this, these days, I, I guess that, you know, um, students are much more comfortable with technology that I was, right? So um, I got my, my first computer when I went to college to, because I needed it to, to do my data analysis for my lab reports, etc. So, but now um, computers are nearly in every home. So every chance that you have to learn some computer skills, any language actually, then you can build on that. So start with, with you know, math, physics, computer, and definitely communication as Raja was saying, because you have to write proposals and the proposals have to be clear. They have to engage the reader so that your um, scientist reading the proposal is not falling asleep and, you know, um, yeah, maybe that is actually overlooked, thinking that um, scientists are basically mathematicians and physicists, while we not only work with equations, but communication, as Raya was saying, is extremely important. And also, in, every, in any stage of applying for a PhD position, for a postdoc position, for a permanent position, scientist position, there is an interview. There is an interview and you have to, as Raya was saying, have your thoughts very well uh, organized and, and be able to communicate your research and what you want to do or you, what you have done in the past in an easy way because you may be talking so, you know, I work in galaxy formation and evolution, and this is not a field that, for example, somebody working on the solar system planets will understand the details, the equations that I use particularly. So I have to be able to explain my research to another scientist that is an expert in a different uh, field. So you have to also develop these communication skills that are that are going to take you to the positions needed to be able to do the research that will focus on math, physics, and, and programming. So communication, do not overlook that. Writing is very important and verbal communication is as, as important as, as writing also. Lisa, I was gonna add one more thing about learning. Um, we've been talking about what you need to learn. You're absolutely right. Computer programming is probably the first thing we should have said, more important almost than the physics and mathematics and, and communication. But there's a difference between what you learn and how you learn it and where you learn it. Learning doesn't only happen in school. Learning can happen in the home. Um, learning doesn't only happen through classes you take, learning can happen individually, where you are making the effort to read and do and learn. Um, doesn't always happen in a group setting, it can happen in individual settings. You can be, you can teach yourself things. You don't have to rely on others to teach you things always. So what Elisa and I talked about was uh, topics or subjects that you want to learn. You notice we didn't say you have to take this class or you have to do, um, you know, you can learn in many ways and, and different people learn in different, uh, learn best in different ways. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that as well. Don't rely only on what is available in your school curriculum. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, we're down to our last, our last minute. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for the fantastic uh, comments and questions. Um, yes, uh, some people have asked about transcripts. Yes, um, I'm happy to provide the transcripts for this session. I had a few requests for that yesterday. Um, I, I sent the, the recording, the transcripts of yesterday's session out already. Um, and so if you'd like that transcript, you can email me here. I'm going to drop it here. Um, and then I'll be happy to provide the transcript for you. Um, okay, so um, Elisa, Raja, and Eric. Eric had to uh, leave a short time ago, um, but this has been a wonderful closed dome session. Um, and uh, we uh, certainly um, are glad to have been able to have so much of your attention, although um, I know it is frustrating to be weathered out. Um, is there any sense for the possibility of this weather clearing in the next few hours, perhaps before the evening is over, Elisa, Raja? So the answer is no. <laughs> it looks oh, like yeah. it's gonna be completely weathered out the, the whole night. The the clouds are very thick and it was snowing and so yeah. They the once it starts snowing, then the 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 humidity level goes to a hundred percent and it has to be below a certain level for a number of minutes to be able to open. So it's very unlikely, actually, very unlikely. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, we are so glad, though, that we were able to shadow you, uh, shadow you all, uh, because, again, this is this is live science. And so, of course, weather plays, well, weather is huge <laughs> in making observations and being able to even just open the telescopes to, um, at, at, at all. And so you here, you're able to see, um, you know, exactly what what happens when there is when this downtime, as Roger said, um, it'd be uh, Roger earlier, actually, maybe you can share again with them uh, as we close out the session. Uh, you said there's several things that uh, ways you can be productive when you're having downtime or when you're weathered out. And I believe you um, talked about um, um, getting an updated program uh, to be able to kind of you see the telescope software on your new computer. That's right. Software installation. Elisa, Eric, and I were talking about science projects that are um, upcoming, uh, projects that are in progress, and next steps for those. So there's a lot. Um, collecting data is not the only thing we do. You know, analysis. We spend more time on analysis than collection. We spend a lot of time on planning. So these are all things that can happen on even on nights when things are cloudy. Fantastic. Well, we will leave it there. Um, thank you to Raja, Elisa, and Eric for allowing us to shadow you um, as you use the attempted to use the Keck 2 telescope to continue your observations of the, these ultra diffuse galaxies. Um, I dropped a link to our to our website and our YouTube channel, uh, well, a few minutes ago, so it's moved up in the chat. Um, but we do have uh, observations um, or sessions with Elisa and Raja and Eric again in May and June. So please register for those sessions. Uh, those are public open sessions. And any teachers here in our group, if you would like to request a dedicated session, um, as we said, we do have, we are grateful and thankful to have collaborators um, in, in, in astronomy um, at other observatories. So you can email me and I will be very happy to discuss setting up um, what we call dedicated sessions for your particular group. And I will put my email, this is our general shadow of the scientist email, but I will check this as well. Shadow at ucsc.edu. Yes, and so we're getting a lot of thank yous. 
uh, in the chat, Elisa and Raja and Eric. This has uh, been a very informative and engaging session.